Hi, my name is Chris Modi. I'm Clinical Program Manager for Heidelberg Engineering Limited. I'm responsible for education and training within the company. Today I'd like to talk to you about interpretation and terminology uh, for OCT images in the application of Retina. What I'd like you to take away from this presentation is the ability to make valid judgments whilst you're scanning the eye. The process of interpretation starts at the point of image acquisition and making valid judgments so that you modify or change your scan protocols. To utilize the fundus reference image to give you clues as to where the OCT scan should be placed and to understand the significance, obviously, of what you're seeing within the OCT image. And then to identify structural changes and pathology and then to link those changes to the visual signs and symptoms the patient may be experiencing. The first question is then where do you place your OCT scan? Uh, the, the simple answer is use the clues that you see within the fundus reference image to guide where that should take place. In this example here we can see a patient that is exhibiting a large area of subretinal fluid with a central oval shaped pigmentary uh, change. This is probably consistent with a retinal pigment epithelial detachment and associated subretinal fluid. When we look at the OCT cross sections, there is evidence of both of those changes on the images that we're seeing. But the profile of the OCT scan changes dramatically depending upon the location that is placed within the eye. So a single scan on its own is not going to provide you with all the information that you require. Here we have an example of an elderly gentleman who's recently undergone cataract surgery. He had a good visual outcome following the surgery and was pleased with the results. This is approximately six weeks later. We can now see an area that is heart-shaped uh, but darker within the fundus reference image. This shows an area of absorption of infrared light on this reference image. The most likely cause of that is fluid within the retina underneath the retina or underneath the RPE. The other thing that can cause changes in the infrared reflectance image is pigmentary change associated with the retinal pigment epithelium or disruption to the photoreceptor layers. The OCT of this patient again confirms evidence of intraretinal fluid and subretinal fluid on the OCT cross section which is obviously very very clearly manifest on the high magnification image. Again, another example, this time in a patient with mild non-proliferative retinopathy who's also got evidence of maculopathy. There's a small change on the infrared reflectance image corresponding to a microaneurysm and then generalized absorption of the infrared reflectance centrally. Again, when we look at the OCT cross-section, the structural change on the OCT corresponds to the area of absorbed reflectance on the OCT image and again, clearly we can see interretinal fluid and subretinal fluid on the OCT cross-section. So, don't forget those basic skills. The fundoscopy skills that you learned when you were uh, as an undergraduate apply now when you're using OCT. If you see areas of hemorrhaging or subretinal fluid, you're likely to see some significant structural change and that's where your OCT scan should be centered. On an autofluorescence image, again, we're seeing changes associated with retinal pigment epithelial atrophy and we're likely to see corresponding retinal atrophy. Again, significant change will be noted on the OCT scan. If there's evidence of breakdown in blood retinal barrier, so you're seeing exudate or multiple microaneurysms, again, you're likely to see structural change associated with that and therefore your OCT needs to cover those areas. And the final example there is of a patient with a branch retinal vein occlusion which is extending into the supratemporal quadrant of the retina. So again, your stands may need to extend outside the field of view that you're currently presented with with the standard 30 degree field. Okay, we're now going to look at normal OCT structure and what we're actually visualizing within the OCT scan and to think about the anatomy and the importance of that or its significance when we're doing OCT scans. So what does the OCT image actually represent? On the nasal aspect of the scan, we can see the retinal nerve fiber layer is thickest. When we look at the temporal aspect of the scan, the retinal nerve fiber layer is thinner. We can see some highly reflective structures within the ganglion cell layer of the retina. These are retinal blood vessels, and you'll note that they cast shadows throughout the OCT cross-section. The internal limiting membrane can be seen as an intermittently hyper-reflective surface structure, and this corresponds to the pedicle aspect of the Muller cells and the foveal depression again is visualized in the center of the scan.
there is good correlation between all OCD devices to what we're seeing in terms of inner retinal structure, going from the retinal nerve fiber layer through ganglion cell layer, inner plexiform, inner nuclear layer, outer plexiform, outer nuclear layer, and finally the external limiting membrane, which represents the apical aspect of the Muller cells. Within the outer nuclear layer of the retina, it's possible to perceive another band, which is Henle's fiber layer. This is where the inner fibers of the photoreceptors pair away to form the foveal depression. The image on the right is of a patient with a macular star, where the exudate follows the radial pattern of Henle's fiber layer. Henle's fiber layer is an important structure, as in retinovascular disease, the Intraretinal fluid or retinal cysts form in front of Henle's fiber layer, as can be seen on this high magnification OCT cross section. Another important structure is the outer plexiform of the eye, as this forms a middle limiting membrane. Again, exudate will not pass beyond the position of the middle limiting membrane. And again, looking closely at this high magnification OCT cross section, you can again see the OCT uh, shows exudate at the level of the outer plexiform layer. When spectral domain OCT was first introduced in about 2005, it was very, very clear we were seeing far more structure visible on the, uh, the images than had been seen previously within time domain OCT images. And this was particularly noticeable in the outer retina but we were seeing more information about what actually we were looking at. So going back to first principles, this is an image of an eye that had been removed for a ciliary body melanoma. The anterior portion of the eye had been sent away for histological assessment, and the pathologist was then asked to remove the remaining vitreous gel and neurosensory retina, and the remaining eye cup was then scanned. The only structures visible, therefore, would be retinal pigment epithelium and Brooks membrane. So the first hyperreflective band from choroid had to be the Brooks membrane RPE complex. We, went, we then sought to find uh, in vivo examples where we would see the same changes. This is an image of a patient with a macular off retinal detachment. Again, neurosensory retina has been detached, and the first hyperreflected band from choroid had to be the Brooks membrane RP complex. Central serous retinopathy causes a serous retinal detachment, and again in this example, the first hyperreflected band from choroid has to be the Brooks membrane RP complex. Taking what we knew about the histology of the eye and working our way back in, we came up with the following classification. Going from retinal pigment epithelium Brooks membrane complex to the RP photoreceptor interdigitation, sometimes referred to as the cone outer segment tips or rod outer segment tips. Then the outer segments of the photoreceptors, the inner outer segment junction, and finally the inner photoreceptor segments. This classification stood for approximately 10 years, but it was recently reclassified based upon the work done by Richard Spade's group in New York, where the inner outer segment junction was reclassified as the ellipsoid of the photoreceptors and the inner segments uh, the myoid of the photoreceptors. This change is important in that it has a, a significant impact on visual function if these layers are damaged. The areas we're looking at are these two hyper and hypo-reflective bands in the outer retina. The ellipsoid of the photoreceptors is responsible for chemical energy production, the myoid for protein synthesis, both of which are necessary for normal photoreceptor physiology. If the layers are disrupted, you can account for significant visual loss in a patient. Again, disruption of the external limiting membrane can also have a significant impact on the patient's vision. So it's also always important to comment on those structures. When it comes to evaluating OCT images, it's important to go through a uh, consistent and repeatable structure. And what I would recommend is the following five-point process. Look at the scan quality, rate the overall appearance of the scan, evaluate the foveal profile, identify whether or not the fovea has been assessed within the scans, and then carry out a structured assessment, commenting on alteration to normal retinal layers and identifying additional retinal structures. Initially, all we want to do is to simply say, is this scan of sufficient quality to make an accurate assessment? In this instance, we can quite clearly identify the position of the retinal nerve fiber layer, the retinal pigment epithelium. We can see a good laminar structure within the OCT cross-section. The scan has not been truncated, and there's no gross shadowing. 
This scan is clearly not of adequate quality and was acquired in the same patient. The patient had cortical media opacity and the high quality scan was acquired through a dilated pupil and through an area of clear media. Then we need to look at the overall scan quality and think about this basic pattern. So identify inner and outer retinal bands. Have you got a good signal to noise ratio? Can you see good laminar structure to the retina? Is the scan truncated? And is there any obvious shadowing on the image? What do I mean by shadowing? This is an old time domain OCT scan of a patient who's got asteroid hyalosis. The slit lamp image shows the asteroid bodies within the vitreous uh, cavity. And these can be picked up on the OCT scan, but also cast profound shadows across the OCT cross-section. With spectral domain OCT imaging, this is much less of a problem, but it can still cause uh, artifacts within the OCT cross-section. Don't forget that normal anatomical structure can also cause shadows, particularly when you're scanning close to the papilla, and the large vessel trunks can again cause dense shadows across the OCT cross-section. Next, we need to look at the overall scan profile. And what we're simply saying is, does this scan look normal or not? What we're looking for, therefore, is a gentle concurvature of the outer retinal band and a shallow M profile to the inner retinal uh, profile based on the position of the fovea. In this instance, we've got epiretinal membrane and associated retinal thickening. Very simply, the scan looks abnormal. Again, another example where we've got a patient with uh, macular edema secondary to branch retinal vein occlusion. Again, an abnormal scan profile. Central serous retinopathy, obviously causing a neurosensory detachment, and again, an abnormal scan profile. So this is a very simple assessment whilst you're acquiring the images. What can cause changes to the overall scan profile? This list is not intended to be exhaustive, but this is the kind of changes you should be considering. Detachment of the retinal pigment epithelium, retinal detachment, and retinal thickening caused by macular edema. Next step is to evaluate the foveal profile. And the foveal profile should be a smooth inverted bell curve, similar to a roller coaster Big Dipper. If that appearance is not present, then you've got an abnormal foveal profile. Here, the foveal depression has been lost, caused by macular pucker, secondary to epiretinal membrane. Again, a patient with cystoid macular edema, secondary to vascular occlusion. Again, we've got an abnormal foveal profile. Common causes, therefore, are macular pusca, lamella holes, macular cysts, and the four stages of macular hole. Again, this is not intended to be an exhaustive list. Have you been able to identify the fovea on your scans? What we're looking for is the position of the retinal nerve fiber layer and the outer plexiform. And at the fovea, these two structures should appear to meet. Can we see this change in the presence of marked macular pathology? So this is a patient with choroidal nevascularization secondary to a choroidal rupture, and there's obviously extensive macular disruption. If we follow the line of the retinal nerve fiber layer and the line of the outer plexiform layer, they do appear to meet at the fovea. So we know we have a foveal cross-section. When we move the scan position superiorly, so we're no longer scanning through the fovea, you'll notice that the retinal nerve fiber layer and the outer plexiform layer are both appear to be continuous across the length of the scan. Again, this is visible on an inferior cross-section as well. Again, with continuous retinal nerve fiber layer and outer plexiform layer. When we move back to the central fovea, again, the retinal nerve fiber layer and the outer plexiform layers appear to meet at the fovea. So we know we have a foveal cross-section. Then we need to carry out a structured assessment of the scans. So we want to observe uh, alteration to normal retinal structure and identify additional structures that may be present in a pre-retinal, epiretinal, intraretinal, and subretinal location. So we're looking for ch any change within the vitreous cavity, on the surface of the retina, within the neurosensory retina, underneath the re neurosensory retina, or underneath the RPE. The vitreous cavity should be minimally reflected. Vitreous is approximately 98% water and about 2% collagen. And therefore, any reflectivity within this uh, structure uh, should be viewed as abnormal. The most likely structure you're going to see is the posterior hyloid associated with the posterior vitreous detachment.
but again, epiretinal membranes, vitreoretinal strands, vitreoretinal traction, synoresis, and neovascularization may also be visible within the vitreous profile or vitreous cavity. Bear in mind that you can pick up or detect changes in density within the vitreous. So you may be able to see the premacular bursa or the space of Martigiani. And again, in a normal subject, this is clearly visible. This change in density within the uh, vitreous, which is the premacular bursa. This is not a posterior vitreous detachment. By applying a plus two diopter defocus to your OCT scanner, you can move the sensitivity of the instrument into the vitreous cavity and almost render the vitreous opaque. Intraretinal changes, again, not an exhaustive list, but typically we're looking for things like choroidal neovascularization, diffuse intraretinal edema, cystoid edema, exudate, scar tissue, and atrophic degeneration. Here you can see an example of choroidal neovascularization with increased reflectivity in front of the RP and associated intraretinal fluid. Another example of cystoid macular edema. Exudate has a very classical appearance and appears highly reflective on the OCT cross-section. In a subretinal location, again, we're looking for things like choroidal neovascularization, RP detachment, drusen, fibrosis, scar tissue, and atrophy. So, very simple process. Determine the quality of the scan, rate the overall scan profile, evaluate the foveal profile, establish whether or not the fovea has been imaged, and then carry out a structural assessment of the scan. Before we can describe the changes uh, within our OCT cross-section, we need to start to use some consistent terminology. So some very simple terms to describe alteration to normal retinal structure. So let's apply these terms to the retinal pigment epithelium in a number of examples. Here, what we're looking at is an irregularity and thickening of the retinal pigment epithelium. Next example shows an elevation of the retinal pigment epithelium. Here we're looking at an interruption of the retinal pigment epithelium in a patient with RP atrophy. Again, another patient with RP atrophy, but this time showing fragmentation of the retinal pigment epithelium. There's a large area of atrophy and then two smaller areas nasal to that. And finally, a rupture of the retinal pigment epithelium in a patient with an RP rip. We then need to comment on additional structures that may be visible within the OCT cross-section. So let's apply this procedure to a clinical example. Firstly, identify the position, identify the position of the retinal pigment epithelium, examine the retinal pigment epithelium, examine the posterior to it, and then anterior to it. Use our standard terminology and then comment on the structure we can visualize in a posterior and anterior location. Once again, we're going to apply a systematic procedure. So start out by looking at the infrared reflectance image. What evidence can we see there? that would support our understanding of what we might be visualizing in the OCT cross-section. Most obvious and striking feature is an area of dense absorption of the infrared light. This is likely to be caused by subretinal fluid or hemorrhage. There's a larger area of diffuse absorption around the central macula, which is most likely to be caused by intraretinal fluid. We can see some highly reflective structures, which is consistent with exudate, and throughout the retinal pigment epithelium, there appears to be a mottled appearance which would be, which would be consistent with a drusenoid type appearance. So what we're looking at, potentially, is somebody with age-related macular degeneration. When we look at the OCT scan now, have we got a good quality scan? We've got a good laminar structure to the retina. The inner and outer retinal bands are visible. It's a high quality scan. Are we scanning through the fovea? If you examine the scan carefully, you'll note you can visualize the position of the retinal nerve fiber layer and the outer plexiform layer, and they do appear to meet at the fovea, although the fovea, foveal depression appears shallowed. There's obvious retinal thickening, 
and the retinal pigment epithelium be clearly identified on the scan. It appears to be elevated, it's undulating, but there's no interruption and no gross thickening or, thick or thinning of the RPE. We next need to examine posterior to the retinal pigment epithelium, and there is some increased reflectivity, which might be consistent with hemorrhage or with neovascularization, and there's some degree of shadowing of the RPE as well. If we examine anterior to the RPE, the most striking feature that we can see is the large hyperreflective voids within the OCT cross-section, which are confined to the inner nuclear and outer nuclear layers of the retina. We can see some highly reflective structures within the uh, OCT cross-section, which is likely to be consistent with exudate. So one might be thinking that we're looking at retinovascular disease. Immediately in front of the retinal pigment epithelium, there is an area of increased reflectivity, which is consistent with intraretinal hemorrhage, and there's a small area of subretinal hemorrhage as well. So we have changes that are consistent with age-related macular degeneration. So we have two conflicting structural changes here, one which would lead us to think of an intraretinal change, and one that's considered consistent with a subretinal change. And this patient, in actual fact, has retinal angiomatous proliferation, which is a chorioretinal anastomosis, which causes gross intraretinal edema, exudate, and subretinal hemorrhaging, and is a subtype of wet AMD. Final thoughts then. Know your chorioretinal anatomy. It's important to revisit uh, all the information that you studied during your undergraduate uh, programs. Familiarise yourself with normal uh, OCT structure and variation within the recordings. Adopt a systematic approach to evaluating your OCT images and familiarise yourself with the etiology of macular disease. And don't forget the basics, vision, signs and symptoms, history and fundus examination are core skills when evaluating your patients. Thank you for listening. I'd just like to acknowledge these contributors to my presentation. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Fahad Kuhl. I'm a consultant ophthalmologist at Royal Hallamshire Hospital in Sheffield. And I'd like to deliver a very short lecture on the commonly occurring chororetinal pathologies uh, you're commonly found in practice. So here we have a case of a 78-year-old man. He notices reduced vision with things looking distorted. He saw his optician who appropriately referred this patient to the Fast Track AMD clinic. And if you look at this colour photograph, you can see near fixation or near the fovea, you have two tiny dot hemorrhages and also a grey lesion just beneath the retina, beneath the retinal blood vessels, suggesting a choroidal neovascular membrane. But if you request an OCT scan, you can see immediately your identified macular edema, you've got macular elevation with loss of the foveal pit, you have these large cysts within the retina suggesting intraretinal fluid, and very subtly, at the outer part of the retina, very deep, you can see the slight um, hyperreflectivity within the OCT, which represents the choroidal neovascular membrane. But here you have an elderly gentleman with geographic atrophy in their left eye, noticing distortion in their right eye, with macular edema, with other signs suggesting AMD. You must have wet AMD on the top of your priority. That patient needs to be fast-tracked to the clinic. We saw this patient very urgently with an fluorescent angiogram, and in the earliest venous phase, you can see this croydon neovascular network light up with the fluorescein. We also use OCT in the hospitalised service to monitor response to therapy. We use it to monitor changes in macular thickness, as well as identifying subretinal fluid, and also looking at cystic appearances of intraretinal fluid or even pigment epithelial detachment. And it allows us to make clinical decisions and ha help us make clinical decisions to deciding additional courses of therapy. So this is a patient pre-anti-VEGF therapy. As you can see, you've got macular edema in both eyes, overlying a fibrotic scar. And now this is a the, the same patient after receiving intravitreal anti-VEGF therapy with satisfactory drying of the macula. So we're going to observe that patient and monitor them closely with OCT for disease recurrence. 
and now I want to shift my focus to diabetic retinopathy. This is a 31-year-old female. She failed to attend the diabetic eye screening program for, for the past five to six years, despite numerous invitations. And she actually saw her optician for a routine sight test, and she was completely asymptomatic. But if you look, you've got significant diabetic retinopathy. And this lady has proliferative diabetic retinopathy with new vessels at the disc, with a fibrovascular network or membrane overlying the supratemporal arcade that's causing traction at the fovea with numerous areas of retinal vascularization within the peripheral retina. And I treated her with laser. We often treat these patients with argon laser photocoagulation, where we put a contact lens on the eye, and then we use laser, which is a very high intense beam of light, to make retinal burns. And then what we're trying to do is to reduce the oxygen requirement in the peripheral retina, therefore reduce the growth factor drive that these abnormal new vessels need to grow, causing regression of disease and reducing the risk of severe sight loss. And with the advent of laser, you're able to reduce the risk of severe vision loss from proliferative retinopathy from 60% to 2%. So it's a very powerful treatment, but these patients need to go to the eye service quickly. And this is a color photograph post-laser, and you can see those areas of retinal neovascularization elsewhere have regressed satisfactorily and the patient's maintaining excellent vision at three to four years post laser. Let's turn our attention to diabetic maculopathy. Unfortunately, laser is less effective in diabetic maculopathy than it is in, it, than it is in proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And that's because if edema is central, you can't laser the central macula, otherwise you're going to induce significant sight loss. Therefore, intravitreal agents are used in these patients to preserve vision. And we define clinically significant macular edema as retinal thickening within 500 microns of the foveal center, or hard exudate with retinal edema, again, within 500 microns of the foveal center, or if you have a large area of retinal edema greater than one disc area that's within one disc area of the foveal center, again, we define that as clinically significant macular edema, and that would be a trigger for us to either institute laser or intravitreal therapy. And how do we do laser photocoagulation? Well, we basically burn all the little microaneurysm changes that you see within that area of edema, and then we also treat the underlying retina in that area of edema. And we use very gentle burns, very small burns, with, with, a, with, with brief exposures of uh, you know, 0 0.01 seconds. And the reason why we do that is because we're really trying to just focus the laser burn just at the photoreceptor, just to the let level of the retinal pigment epithelium and not cause any further unnecessary collateral damage. So this is a case example of somebody I treated with laser. So this is the photograph of their left eye. So they've got 6-5 vision, the fovea is dry, you've got one disc area of circinate exudation that's just supratemporal to the fovea with retinal edema. So what do you do with that patient? Do you wait till the edema gets worse and involves their central vision with a drop in vision? Or do you in institute some very gentle laser to dry out that area and preserve their vision and reduce their risk of moderate vision loss? This is an OCT scan of that same patient at baseline. And again, if you look at the temporal portion of that OCT scan, you can see there's some retinal thickening with a few interretinal cysts in that area. So we instituted retinal therapy, some gentle laser, and you can hardly see the burns on that color fundus photograph, but you can see the number of exudates have reduced. But as soon as you use something called blue laser autofluorescence, which shows up the retinal pigment epithelium better, you can see the distribution of burns that I applied to that patient. And again, if you look at the OCT scan post laser, you can see that area of retina that was bumpy uh, baseline has now dried up very nicely with very little damage to the underlying photoreceptors. And again, if you look at the infrared reflectance on the left side of that image, you again, you can see those burns that I've done. And you can see they're nowhere near the fovea. So we're not threatening the fovea, we're just trying to prevent moderate vision loss from diabetic maculopathy. But like I said to you earlier, 
if the edema is actually involving the center, causing a drop of vision, you can't laser the center of the vision. So then we have to turn our attentions to intravitreal therapy, injections to the eye, and the mainstay is using anti-VEGF therapy. And at the moment in the NHS, we use a drug called ranibizumab or lucentis, and we can use that in any patient that has central macular thickness greater than 400 microns. This is a colour picture showing an injection into the eye, and unfortunately, we can't give this as a drop, we can't give it as a systemic medication. It has to be delivered as an injection into the pars planar, which is about four millimetres behind the limbus. But look at, the, look at this graph here. On average, patients with anti-VEGF therapy gain nine to 10 letters in vision. So potentially, you can take somebody who can't drive and improve their vision so they can now drive. So this really make, has made a difference to the lives of our patients with diabetic maculopathy and keeping them working and keeping them in employment. The downside is they need a lot of injections. So in year one, of 13 possible injections they could have got in the study, they needed eight or nine. And in year two, they needed at least another three injections. And in year two and three, another two or three injections. So having a diagnosis of diabetic maculopathy or centre involving diabetic maculopathy, although we've got fantastic treatments, it really is a cent they are tied to the hospital for the next three to four to five years receiving regular treatments. But the benefit is that we can, pres we can preserve vision, give them back vision that's lost. And hopefully in the meantime, they're improving their sugar control, blood pressure control, and we're minimising further risk to vision. And also more recently, we now have sustained delivery implants, which can give steroid over three years with similar gains in vision. Something called Alluvian, which was released in, uh, which was, um, we were allowed to use it in the NHS as of December of last year. And again, it's a small implant that again is injected into the eye and that releases sub microgram doses of steroid consistently over three years. And again, patients on this treatment, about 30 to 40% gained 15 letters in vision, so three lines in vision. So real meaningful changes, improvement in vision quality sustained for three years. So we've got some fantastic treatments now for diabetic maculopathy. And I'd like to just emphasize this with a case of a 30-year-old patient, type 1 diabetes, who represented to my clinic with a two to three month history of blurred vision. This was his colour funders photograph. Again, he's got advanced proliferative diabetic retinopathy. You can see that pre-retinal hemorrhage inferiorly with that large venous loop overlying the infratemporal arcade with exudation at the macula. You can see that large area of retinal vessels nasal to the optic disc. And this is despite reasonable laser treatment. And this is his left eye with gross diabetic maculopathy centrally with again near vascularization of the disc and elsewhere. And this is relentless disease despite laser treatment. And you can see that large venous loop again overlying the arcade. This was his OCT. Again, you can see marked macular thickening with loss of the foveal pit with numerous cysts, hyperreflective cysts within the retina, and this tiny puddle of fluid just beneath the retina suggesting gross macular edema. And in the left eye, again, gross macular edema with subretinal fluid. When we did his volume maps, you could see his macular, macular thicknesses were anything between five to 600 microns. So I was able to offer him further laser treatment, but also because of his macular edema, intravitreal therapy with fantastic regression of his proliferative disease and drying out of his macula. And this patient's still in, in employment, still holding, on a hand, holding down a job, and he's the main breadwinner for his family. Now let's shift our focus to myopic choroidal nevascularization. Pathological myopia is characterized by progressive myopia of more than six diopters. And anybody with an axial length of over 26 millimeters 
with progressive choroidal degeneration in the posterior pole. Patients with choroidal neovascularization will complain of sudden distortion and an abrupt drop in visual acuity. And the choroidal neovascularization can either be hemorrhagic or pigmented. So this is a colour from this photograph of a patient with a sudden drop in vision in that right eye with a blind spot. And as you can see, you've got a large macular hemorrhage that's beneath the retina, beneath the retinal vessels, centrally. And then nasal to that, you have a grey pigmented lesion, which is probably the choroidal neovascular membrane. And you can see it's a myopic eye because you can see there's a tilted optic disc with a small myopic crescent inferiorly. This is their fluorescent angiogram, and you can see in the early phase, this choroidal neovascular network lighting up early in the fluorescent angiogram. And this is the OCT. So you can see that there's abnormal elevation of the OCT with this large blob of hemorrhage beneath the retina, but you don't see much in the way of fluid. So just be very cautious in patients with choroidal neovascularization, listen to the symptoms. Yes, do an OCT, but if the OCT doesn't show much in the way of macular edema, that patient still needs prompt referral to hospital because they don't seem to leak as much as, we say, in age-related macular degeneration. And this is a vertical scan of that same patient showing an abnormal elevation centrally with this hyper-reflective lesion beneath the retina that, again, represents the blob of hemorrhage in the subretinal area. And why do we need to see this patient? Because now, again, Lucentis is approved for the treatment of myopic chorodine vascularization with excellent results in stabilizing and maybe even improving vision. Now let's shift the focus to something we see commonly in practice, which is central serous retinopathy. And that's characterized by the accumulation of subretinal fluid at the posterior pole of the fundus, causing a very circumscribed area of a neurosensory retinal detachment at the posterior pole. Who does central serous retinopathy commonly affect? Well, it affects those patients between 35 and 50 years of age with that type A stressful personality. It's also been associated with patients who use steroid, be it topical, be it inhaled, uh, be, be it uh, oral. And what symptoms do patients with CSR get? They can get mild blurring of vision to various degrees of central distortion or even the development of a scotoma, a blind spot, or even color vision abnormalities. And the visual acuity in the acute stage may range from 6.6 to 660. And when you examine them clinically, you often see this very transparent blister at the posterior pole. You can often reassure the patient because it's good news, because it resolves spontaneously within four months with almost full recovery of the vision. But recurrences are frequent and occur, can occur in about a third to a half of patients, and 10% of patients can have three or more recurrences. So this is a 48-year-old female with recurrent micropsia and distortion in her right eye, and she was referred by her neighboring of FAMIC unit. This was her color fundus photograph, with the normal light reflex of the foveal edge being absent and replaced by reflex marking the limits of the elevated area. This was her OCT, and you can see a beautiful neurosensory detachment. So you've got, again, marked elevation of the retina. But you look at where that hyperreflective space is. It's beneath the retina and above the RPE. So this is subretinal fluid. We did a fluorescein, which showed some small leaky spots. So that's where the fluid is coming in and causing the detachment of the retina. And we treated this lady with laser. And if you look at that infrared reflectance on the right-hand side, you can see the tiny laser spots that I applied with excellent resolution of that macular edema. Six months post, almost normalization with good recovery of vision. So who, again, should you refer? I, I think all patients with central serous retinopathy should be referred, be it acute, recurrent, or chronic. And that's because there's a high risk of misdiagnosis. Because to make a diagnosis of CSR, you've got to exclude other causes, such as uveitis, multiple, multiple myeloma. In fact, some macular dystrophies can masquerade as central serous retinopathy, and even wet age-related macular degeneration, 
can be mistaken as CSR. So in my opinion, all patients with a neurosensory attachment need to be referred to hospital. But if you think it's CSR, hopefully you can give that patient reassuring signals. Now let's turn our attention to vitromacular interface disorders. OCT is probably the most sensitive imaging modality in identifying the vitromacular interface. So disorders such as epiretinal membrane, vitromacular attraction syndrome and macular hole are all readily imaged and recognised by OCT and I would say probably to a higher standard than biomicroscopy. What is epiretinal membrane? Well it re represents an abnormal glial, pro glial proliferation on the surface of the retina, commonly the fovea. And, it's, and it, in its early stages, it's usually asymptomatic. But progression can ma may lead to metamorphopsia or moderate to severe impairment. And all patients with epiretinal membrane need a full fundal exam to exclude any secondary pathologies. This is an OCT of somebody with a good going epiretinal membrane. And you can see the epiretinal membrane is a, as a hyper reflective band that is separated from the inner retina with multiple focal points of attachment with retinal thickening and inner retinal folds. And if that patient was symptomatic, we would consider vitrectomy and possibly membrane peeling to reduce their symptoms. What about vitromacular attraction syndrome? Well, that differs from epiretinal membrane because the posterior hyaloid remains attached to the peripheral region. And what is it? Essentially, it's an incomplete posterior vitreous attachment with persistent vitreous adhesion at the macula. And sometimes vitromacular attraction syndrome can be impossible to identify in clinical exam, yet will be evident on OCT. So this is somebody with vitromacular adhesion. So you have separation of the vitreous from the retina, but it's not complete. You've still got a focal attachment in the foveal area. But as you can see on that OCT, there's no visible structural change and the patient is asymptomatic. This patient does not need to be referred to hospital. And you can advise them to monitor for symptoms. But this patient, I probably would refer to hospital. Because again, you can see this V-shaped posterior vitreous detachment temporally and nasally to the fovea. But again, the vitreous remains attached to the fovea. And again, it's associated with abnormalities on the OCT of retinal contour, with itcheretinal edema, or even foveal detachment. And if that patient's symptomatic, it may be worthwhile referring that patient to hospital because they can consider ochroplasmin, which is an intravitreal agent that pharmacologically cleaves the vitreous from the fovea, relieving that traction, or they may even need surgery uh, such as a past plane of vitrectomy. But if they're symptomatic and you can see definite structural change, it's worthwhile referring that patient with vitromacular attraction syndrome. And again, a patient like this, where they have a broad adhesion of the foveal region, they're going to need surgery to relieve their symptoms. So who to refer? Interestingly, ochroplasmin is only recommending as an option for treating patients with vitromacular attraction only if an epiretinal membrane is not present and they either have a stage two full thickness macular hole or they have severe symptoms. So we're not, ref you don't need to refer every patient you notice an OCT abnormality, talk to the patient. If the patient's symptomatic with subjective distortion or visual disturbance, yes, it's worth a referral. But please don't refer incidental findings of epiretinal membrane or vitromacular attraction a routine sight test unless there's clear evidence of visual decline or it's affecting their activities of daily living. Let's go to a case history of a 73-year-old female with sudden onset distortion and blurred central vision in the left eye in the preceding six to eight weeks. She's otherwise fit and well and vision acuity was recorded 6-9 in the right eye, 6-36 in the left eye. And she was noted to have a small central scotoma, central scotoma on the AMSLA chart in the left eye. Anterior seg segment examination was unremarkable with normal intraocular pressures. This is her right colour fundus photograph, which essentially is normal. And in the left, 
if I can draw your attention to the central macula, you might just be able to see a small hole. I'm highlighting it here with uh, some drawings. So in summary, this is a 73-year-old female with sudden onset of distortion, with, a proper, uh, with an absolute scotoma on the AMSA chart. And when you look at the by microscopy, she has a full thickness macular hole. So we're looking at a full stage two macular hole. But say if you were unsure, what would you do next? What kind of imaging could you request? I would probably request an OCT. And this is the OCT of her right eye, and it shows vitromacular traction. So it demonstrates perifoveal separation of the posterior hyaloid. We've got focal vitreous attachment to the fovea. So there's potential for hole formation in this better fellow eye. Otherwise, the retinal layers look intact with a healthy, continuous inner se outer segment junction. The um, observant of you will notice this very small, solid dome-shaped hyperreflective lesion just beneath the retina. And that's probably adult vitelliform dystrophy, but it's just an incidental finding. But look at the left eye. That demonstrates a full thickness retinal defect with interruption of the inner segment outer segment junction line, so you've got the photoreceptors are missing. Furthermore, there's peripheral vitreous separation with persistent adherence of the vitreous to the foveal retina, leading to traction of the foveal retina and resulting in this hole formation. And because it's a small hole, they've got a favorable prognosis and will benefit from surgery. So how do we treat this patient? Well, we treated her with vitrectomy, with an internal limiting membrane peel, and she had a gas bubble to try and improve the closure rate. And this was her post-operative OCT appearance. And I'd like you all to answer, or kind of think to yourselves, what do you predict the vision to be? Better, worse, or the same? Those of you who said it was the same or worse are actually correct. But how can that be? Again, if you look at the OCT, you've got good anatomical closure of that hole, yet that patient has not gained any functional vision. And it's the OCT that gives you the answer. Because again, if you look, the inner segment, outer segment junction is missing centrally on that OCT image with downward collapse of the outer nuclear layer with foveal atrophy. So the OCT appearance allowed us to explain the paradox of technically successful surgery, yet worse vision. So again, patients with macular hole, who should you refer? All cases of patients with OCT confirmed macular hole should be referred to the hospitalized service for further management. Let's turn our attention to again something that's very common that we see, retinal vein occlusion. And we have two types of vein occlusions. Let's deal first with branch retinal vein occlusion, so the patient can come in with acute, painless vision loss. But when you examine them clinically, you find that the hemorrhages are confined to one quadrant of the retina with an otherwise normal fundus. And the vision tends to be fairly, fairly good. And the complications you can get with branch vein occlusion include macular edema and retinal neovascularization. Or you can get a central retinal vein occlusion that can be either non-ischemic or ischemic, but essentially you have widespread distribution of hemorrhages in all four quadrants with disc edema and macular edema. And again, those need to be referred fairly promptly to hospital for intervention because again, we have good treatments, but also those patients need good workup to try and identify any underlying cardiovascular risk factors that may predispose them to this retinal vascular occlusion. So let's present Mr. PP. He's a 60-year-old gentleman, asymptomatic. It was an optician referral. His vision 6'5", 6'12 in the left eye. He hadn't actually noticed any problem with his left eye. Clinically, you can see this large area of macular exudation and macular edema centrally. You can see it much more apparently on the red free image. The right eye is completely normal. He has a branch retinal vein occlusion. And if you look at his fluorescein, you can see an area of hyperfluorescence from those damaged capillaries secondary to the branch retinal vein occlusion. And that's what's causing his macular edema and macular swelling. The OCT again shows that beautifully. 
with loss of the fulfilled pit, with macular elevation, and those hyper-reflective cysts centrally. I treated him with laser, with really good results. And again, if you look at the autofluorescence, you can see those burns with nice resolution of his, of his edema and maintenance of that 612 vision in the long term. We also identified his blood pressure and his underlying hypercholesterolemia, which we've addressed. This is another patient who again presented through the eye casualty with acute on chronic loss of vision. So he's already aware that his vision was not great, but he'd noticed a sudden drop in the right eye, reducing his vision to six over 60. And again, if you look at this color photograph, you're looking at an inferior hemiretinal vein occlusion. So the, qu the quadrant of hemorrhages are just affecting the lower half of the fundus. The top half of the fundus appears to be normal. And you've got this large pre-retinal hemorrhage that's obscuring the underlying retinal vessels that suggests that there must be underlying retinal neovascularization. This is just some other photographs showing some more of that particular patient. And you can see on this particular image, you've got engorgement of that inferior vein, suggesting an inferior retinal vein occlusion. And this is a picture showing some more pre-retinal hemorrhages. And this is an OCT. And again, you can see that retinal hemorrhage is definitely pre-retinal because you can see a hyper-reflective um, signal that's in front of the retina, but below the hyaloid face. I treated him with laser, and look at that. Fantastic resolution of his macular hemorrhage with a recovery of his vision. And by the way, we also identified his blood pressure of greater than 210 systolic and 120 diastolic. He is referred very quickly to the medical, uh, to, 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 the, to the medics for management of his hypertension. And again, this is OCT subsequently with normalization of that uh, macular anatomy. Another case of vein occlusion, this patient noticed sudden onset of visual disturbance in the right eye. He attends my clinic with vision of 636 on the right, 66 on the left. Here you have, again, a, a good going central retinal vein occlusion with macular edema, with widespread hemorrhages affecting all four quadrants of the retina, with gross macular edema on OCT. This patient needs to be referred to hospital. Why? Because we can manage these patients very effectively. So we have steroid treatments in the form of Ozidex, which is a water-soluble corticosteroid implant that kind of dissolves in the eye over a three to six month period. We again inject it through the pass planar, and it sits as a small implant in the inferior vitreous leaching out steroid over a three to six month period. But again, you get good gains in vision that tail off by six months as the drug begins to disappear. But then when you re-inject that patient at six months, you gain back that loss in vision and you can maintain some improvements in vision that, you, that, that, that are better than natural history alone. Or you can treat them with anti-VEGF. And we now have two types of anti-VEGF. Anti both ranibizumab and ILEA for, the, for use in patients with vein occlusion. So who to refer? You need to refer all new onset central retinal vein occlusion patients with or without macular edema. Refer all new onset branch retinal vein occlusion patients with or without macular, macular edema. But you probably don't need to refer old compensated and collateralized retinal vein occlusions where the patient's got good vision and the patient's not aware of recent symptomatic change it may be prudent just to refer them back to their GP for a general cardiovascular workup to identify in any underlying risk factors. Me as an ophthalmologist, I'm not going to be able to offer any new treatment to rehabilitate or improve on vision. And very briefly, retinal artery occlusion. If a patient notices sudden dramatic change, such as this 85 year old gentleman, his vision is still 6'6 in both eyes. Look at the color picture. You've got inferior retinal pallor due to the occlusion. And you can even see the embolus uh, affecting the artery. And then look at the OCT. You can see in that temporal half, or that lower half, sorry, of the scan, you can see hyperreflectivity of the inner retina.
suggesting a, a retinal artery occlusion. And that's a very good sign. That's because you've blocked the, inner ret uh, the retinal artery, which supplies the oxygen to the inner retina, and therefore you get inner retinal edema and inner retinal hyperreflectivity. Very few things give this very characteristic OCT appearance. And these patients, again, need to be referred to hospital because we can restore circulation if, it's, if we catch them early enough. We also need to exclude giant cell arteritis, but they also need to be referred to the stroke services because they're a high risk of developing a stroke. So today they've developed a, an arterial occlusion. Tomorrow they may develop something more serious. And why? Because arterial occlusions on the whole tend to be caused by emboli. And they can have different sources, either from the carotid artery or from the heart. So all patients with suspected acute retinal artery occlusion should be referred to access the fast track stroke service. And unlike all the other conditions I've discussed today, where when I say refer urgently to hospital, I'm saying within the next few days, or the same day if possible, here you've really got to act fast. And if you notice this patient, see this patient on a Saturday, you may actually need to call the on-call ophthalmologist and get them in urgently. Lastly, I just thought we'll show, show some in two interesting cases. So you may not see them commonly in your practice. One is Valsava retinopathy. This was first described by Duane in 1972, and it's usually subhyloid, and it's because you get a spontaneous rupture in the vitreous cavity. And conservative management is usually simple observation, but sometimes we can do YAG laser membranotomies, which speed up the uh, recovery. And this is a case of a 30-year-old female. She's 38 weeks pregnant with sudden painless loss of vision following an episode of morning sickness. And you can see this large pre-macular subhyloid hemorrhage that's obscuring the macula, obscuring the blood vessels. So no wonder she can't see. Here's the OCT, which shows beautifully that the blood is beneath the hyloid and in front of the retina. I treated her with uh, YAG laser we are using a fundus lens and using the YAG laser, which we normally use for capsulotomy to treat posterior capsular pacification following cataract surgery, we can actually use it to, to create a little tear in the hyaluronic face and releasing the blood. And this is the patient post-operatively. The blood's cleared with good recovery of vision. And this is the OCT post. And lastly, somebody with late onset coats. Again, this patient was seen by an optician in the high street who actually made the diagnosis. Um, we often see these temporal fusiform and saccular vascular dilatations or hard exudates in the peripheral retina. We think it's congenital. It tends to affect one eye. And this is a 34-year-old gentleman referred to me by an optician with a three to four week history of reducing vision in the right eye and at presentation, his vision was 680 in the right eye, 65 in the left eye. And this was his color fundus photograph showing macular edema with macular exudation and this vasoproliferative tumor just in the temporal fundus. That's his OCT showing gross macular edema with elevation of the retina and subretinal fluid. This was him following two anti-VEGF injections and laser treatment with fantastic resolution of his exudation and the macular edema. And this patient maintained excellent vision of 6.5, three to four years following intervention. And this is his OCT, two to three years post-intervention with satisfactory normalization of the fovoal anatomy and resolution of the temporal macular thickening. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for listening.